So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the My Horse University and the University of Minnesota's live webcast titled Equine Genetics 101. This presentation is part of a new webcast series which will be offered to bring horse enthusiasts the most up-to-date information on equine genetics and is the first of seven webcasts that will be offered. The series is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's National Research Initiative. Future webcasts will focus on genetic applications, man management of equine metabolic syndrome and shivers, and advances in equine genetics. Our presenter today is Dr. Molly McHugh. Molly is an assistant professor in veterinary population medicine and a Morris Animal Foundation fellow at the University of Minnesota Equine Center. Dr. McHugh was just three years old when she decided to become a veterinarian. True to her dreams, she graduated from Kansas State University with a bachelor's degree in veterinary medicine and animal science and in 2000 received her DVM degree. She followed this with an internship at the University of Georgia Athens and both a master's degree and a residency in equine internal medicine at Kansas State University. Dr. McHugh came to the University of Minnesota to pursue her doctoral degree in comparative and molecular biosciences and became part of the University of Minnesota Equine Center team led by Dr. Stephanie Valberg and Dr. Jim Mickelson that discovered the genetic basis of PSSM in horses. I want you all to please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation via the text chat at the bottom of your screen. The questions today are going to be collected by Dr. Krishona Martinson. Krishona is an ass assistant professor and equine extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. Also as a reminder, the presentation today is being recorded and we will be uploading it to our website if you would like to review it at a later date. So at this time, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. McHugh. Thank you and welcome to everybody who's logged in today. I really appreciate the interest in one of my favorite subjects, um, which is genetics. So just to kind of walk through what I'd like to do today um, is I'd like to kind of review some of the basic genetics principles that um, you may have learned somewhere along the way or might be new to you, um, but kind of look at the basic things that we think about when we're doing genetic disease research, um, when we're thinking about breeding horses, um, and when we're diagnosing genetic diseases as veterinarians. I also want to spend a little time talking about why genetics is so exciting and why you're hearing a lot more about genetics um, from veterinarians and equine researchers because we've had a lot of very exciting um, advances in equine genetics, particularly in the last four to five years. Um, so there's a lot of new things that we know and new things that we can do and I think this field will really be rapidly advancing. So I want to try to give you a little bit of an appreciation um, of that. And I also want to let you know where we're heading as equine geneticists with research and kind of review the diseases that we already know about um, just to help you make more informed breeding decisions if you're breeders or help you understand a diagnosis in your horse if you've got a horse with genetic disease. So we'll get started and really a lot of the excitement in equine genetics that we've seen in the last um, four to five years has revolved around the fact that we now have a sequence of the equine genome. So some of you may be familiar with this idea because the human genome was sequenced um, in the last decade. There was a lot of publication and publicity um, made the national news and international news about the exciting thing of actually having a sequence of the genome. So what does that mean? Well, the genome basically is the term that we use for all of the genes within an animal, all of the DNA. And so when it's sequenced, we actually have base pair by base pair, the order and which letter, A, G, T, or C, um, that DNA has. And so the horse sequence now is complete. Um, the very first draft we had in February of 2007. So we've had it for a couple of years. And as you can see here on your screen, there's a picture of a gray horse. She's a thoroughbred mare named Twilight, who actually is a research horse at Cornell University, was the horse that was sequenced. And so DNA from Twilight was used to create the sequence. And now as researchers, we can compare the sequence of any other horse um, to her if we choose to sequence a segment of that horse's DNA. Um, why was the sequence so exciting to us? Well, not only teaching us a lot about biology of horses and biology of other species um, by comparing sequ sequences, it really rapidly increases the speed at which we can conduct genetic research. 
Um, it, it allows us to uh, find new information, find new genetic uh, mutations and, all, and those kind of things. What used to take us 15 or 20 years, we now think we can do in two to three years. So it's very, very exciting for us as researchers. It's exciting for us as veterinarians. Um, and it's exciting for horse owners, I think, because you're going to have a lot more information um, in the next few years. So this slide is just a diagram actually kind of comparing what happened um, in human medicine when they worked towards getting to the point where they had sequenced the human genome. So you can see that in the late 80s and early 90s, they were creating genetic tools which we call um, genome maps. So there was the first meeting about having a map of the genome and then um, both a low resolution map in the early 90s and a high resolution map um, in the late 90s. And those are the blue arrows um, on this diagram. Well, the yellow bars in this picture pr uh, represent the pace at which new genetic mutations were discovered in people. And you can see that um, with each one of these things, the creation of a map, both low resolution and high resolution, it really increased the pace of um, gene discovery. And in 2001, when they had the first draft of the human gene sequence, um, it increased rapidly. And, it, and in people, we're talking about several hundred genetic mutations had been identified. Um, and as time continues to go on, this really ends in about 2005. But basically, discovery um, rate has been exponential for understanding genetic disease and genetic mutation um, in people. So to just kind of put comparison on it um, in horses, we have been working on the same technology, but it's taken a little bit longer. Um, as typical in domestic animal species, we're a little bit behind um, human research. But basically, the first genetic mutation in horses was discovered in 1992. And that's the disease um, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, or HYPP. Um, which is a genetic disease in quarter horses, which has been attributed um, to the descendants of the stallion impressive. And so this may be a disease as horse people that you're likely familiar with or have heard of. Um, after discovery of that mutation in the mid-90s, there was the first meeting of a group of people who were very interested in equine genetic research. Um, and a group here from the University of Minnesota, as well as researchers from around the world, where they really got together and determined that having an equine genome map would be the thing that we needed to advance our knowledge about equine genetic disease and also about other equine traits, um, including coat color and some other things, and coat color really being the biggest non-disease trait that we know the most about in horses right now. That group met in the mid-90s, and by the year about 2000, 2001, they had the first low-resolution map. Um, and then just recently, at the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, we had our first high-resolution map. And luckily for us, the National Institutes of Health decided about the same time to sequence the equine genome. So we really had an explosion of information in the last couple of years that we could use to um, detect genetic mutations in horses. So right now, the number of genetic mutations that we have is low, less than a dozen. But as you can see, the kind of orangish um, peach colored bars on this graph, we expect, just like in people, our information and in the gen genetic diseases that we've identified mutations for to grow exponentially um, in horses over the next decade or so. So how do we go about finding a disease gene, or um, you know, why is it important? And why are these tools helpful? Well, these tools are helpful because when we recognize a genetic disease in horses, um, and we know that there must be an underlying genetic mutation, there's one of two ways that we can find that mutation. <coughs> Excuse me. The first way is what was done with HYPP, where there was a very, very similar disease in people, actually called HYPP as well, that we could look at the gene that caused the disease in people look at horses and sequence the gene in horses and prove that horses had a um, deficit in the same gene. Um, the other option we have is when we have no idea what the gene is, we have to somehow pick one of 20,000 different genes that every horse has um, to start sequencing and identifying a mutation. Well, the way we do this is use the tools that have been um, created from the genome sequence. So from the genome sequence, we now have 60,000 genetic markers that we can use to help us identify which of the 20,000 different genes we need to start sequencing to look for a mutation. 
So just a little bit of review of genetics now, um, as we talked a little bit about where we're going in equine genetics. So for most of you, this will be review. For some of you, it may be new. But basically, with these 20,000 different genes, each horse has two copies of every gene, one which they receive from their sire and one which they receive from their dam. We call the genotype the combination of genes that a horse has. So um, their genotype is the combination of 20,000 gene copies that they have, one from the sire, one from the dam. And it's going to be different um, in every individual horse, um, unless they're identical twins, which we don't see that often in horses. So the genotype is really what makes them unique individuals, like it does in any other species. The phenotype is the term for what we see as a result of the genotype. So for example, coat color. A horse has a specific genotype which results in a specific coat color, which is their phenotype. Um, eye color is the classic example used um, in all species. And then also for our area of interest here at the University of Minnesota, and as well as the interest of many of the equine researchers, is their phenotype is the presence or absence of a particular genetic disease. So the simplest way that we look at genetic diseases are what we call the Mendelian diseases. So um, most of us learned in school, usually in high school biology, about Gregor Mendel, the monk who bred pea plants, and looked at their height and the color of their flower and the shape of the pea pods. Um, and so was able to identify or basically come up with the idea that these plants had genes that were transferred from parent generation to offspring generation in a certain way. And so the characteristics that Gregor Mendel identified were all single genes or simple genetic diseases, and that one gene really controlled the phenotype. Um, and so you can see here, simple genetic diseases basically result from a mutation in one of the 20,000 um, genes. And those simple genetic diseases, 99% of the time, are either dominant or recessive diseases. There are a few other things that we won't really have the time to get into today. Um, Co-dominant diseases, sex-linked diseases, and sex-influenced diseases. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on those types of inheritance today just because we haven't identified any of those traits in horses yet. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about dominant recessive diseases, since those will be the majority of simple gene diseases. So a question that I get from um, a lot of people, horse owners and also veterinarians, when I'm kind of functioning in my capacity as a, a clinician here at the university is, why study genetic diseases? Um, are they're not really that important in horses? And, and I say to that, there's kind of two things. One, we don't recognize genetic diseases as often as we should, I think, in horses. And as we're getting more information, we're realizing that they are an important cause of disease. And that, two, when we do have a genetic mutation in horses, um, they're often surprisingly common, much more common than genetic diseases are in other species. Um, people, for example, is usually the frame of reference um, that most of us have. But horses, like purebred dogs that have a high incidence of genetic disease as well, um, have, have this high incidence of disease for a couple of reasons. First is, is that many, many of our horse breeds started with one single um, important stallion or just a few important founders. Um, for example, 80% of thoroughbreds are thought to be descendants from, of 10 stallions. And so when someone sets out to establish a horse breed, they pick a few individual horses um, that have the characteristics that they're interested in and then breed from there. So the genetic pool is the term that we like to use. The genetic pool um, that the breed was started from is very, very small. So if there's a mutation um, in one of those 10 thoroughbred stallions, for example, um, it could be in a huge percentage of the thoroughbred breed by the time all the descendants are accounted for. The other thing is, is that we all know from horse breeding that popularity leads to predominance of certain sire lines. So if you've got a stallion that's very, very good, um, he often is bred to all the time and has a large number of offspring. And this is even um, intensified by the fact that many, many breeds allow artificial insemination, um, embryo transfer, and things like that, that artificially increase the number of offspring a horse could have naturally without assistance. 
So if we take those things into consideration, we might assume that an average equine stallion um, is going to produce about 250 offspring in his lifetime with a possible maximum of over um, 3,000 or even more depending on um, how many times he's collected, whether artificial assimilation is um, allowed uh, in the breed. When we contrast that to people where we think of genetic disease as being relatively low, let's say the average human male has two and a half offspring per lifetime with a likely maximum of somewhere around 10. Um, or maybe a few more. We can see why um, these genetic diseases become basically intensified in horse breeding populations. So I want to take a little bit of time um, just to think about the transmission of diseases when the traits are recessive and when the traits are dominant. And so this is one area that I like to spend a lot of time on when I'm talking to um, horse owners and actually sometimes veterinarians um, because it's something that we learn about and it's something that we often forget about. So I've put together this little table here. If you look across the top and in blue type is the sire's genotype. So in this instance we're going to say N stands for the normal allele or the normal gene that doesn't cause disease and A stands for the affected allele um, or the affected gene that causes disease. So in blue is the stallion's genotype and kind of the purple color is the dam's genotype. So it starts out pretty simple if you look in the upper left hand um, square where you have one normal in from the stallion, one normal in from the dam, you're going to have a normal offspring. Obviously there's um, not affected here. Um, when we look down again where we are in the in slash in column for the sire and now the a slash in column from the dam, we have two possible combinations that the offspring's genotype is going to be, either NN or NA. Because it's a recessive disease and we have to have two copies of the A allele to cause disease, we still have 0% for the number of offspring that would be affected with disease um, from this breeding. So if we look finally at the bottom column where we have NN from the sire versus AA for the dam, again, all of the offspring are going to get a normal N from their sire and an affected A from their dam, but because this is a recessive disease, they will not show any phenotype of this disease. So contrast that um, if we move over to the column um, all the way over to the right where the sire's genotype is AA, he's affected with the disease and we breed him um, to a dam that's NN or normal. In this instance, while the sire can have the phenotype um, and the dam does not, all your offspring are going to be normal, but those offspring are now going to have an A allele and be carriers for the disease. When we breed um, an affected stallion to a dam that has an A and an N, so now we're on the middle box in this column all the way to the right, you'll see that there's two combinations. There's either an AN or an AA. And the way that this works out by, by chance alone is that 75% of your offspring will actually be affected with disease if you inadvertently breed an affected animal to an animal that's a carrier. And then finally, affected to affected is going to give you an affected animal 100% of the time. So probably um, one of the most important things to recognize from this diagram is if we look at the box right in the middle where we're breeding an AN dam, a carrier dam, to an AN stallion, a carrier stallion, because this is often a situation um, that people are looking at with breeding and recessive disease and asking a question about. The goal is to have an offspring that's not affected um, and, the, and both of the parents we know are carriers for the disease. And so with this, there's four possible combinations. Um, that the offspring can have. You can see them listed there. And 25% of the time you're going to have an individual that's affected. So that's kind of how things go with recessive disease and really recessive traits are a lot easy to, easier to deal with um, and breed around because while you can create um, an individual that's affected, most of the time we're creating individuals that are carriers, especially when breeding two carriers. Now, dominant diseases are a different ball, ball game. So a dominant disease means that you have to have only one copy of the mutant gene and you have the disease. So whereas with recessive disease, you had to be AA to be affected, 
Now with dominant disease, you can be AN or AA, and you're affected with disease. So on this diagram, if we compare it to the previous one, when we look at the percentage of affected offspring, it's much higher. Um, so the sire and the dam that are NN are going to be normal, but the AN sire, the AA sire, the AN dam, or the AA dam will all have disease. And so basically if you have only one parent, so let's look at the um, column with the sire who's AN, if we look down that column, even if you have only one parent that's affected, half of the time your offspring will be affected with disease. If you have two parents that are affected heterozygously, meaning they have one copy of the mutation, 75% of the time your offspring is going to be affected with the disease, and 25% of the time your offspring is going to have two copies of the mutant allele, or BAA, and those cases typically with genetic diseases are worse. Um, and then finally, if you breed an animal that's AA, um, be the sire or the dam, 100% of their offspring are going to have disease because they will always pass the A allele on. So when we breed horses with genetic diseases, these things are important to recognize and that dominant diseases are a lot harder to breed away from um, if they're present in the population. So where are we with Mendelian diseases in horses? Right now, all the mutations that we know about in horses are um, what we call Mendelian mutations. Um, I've already mentioned hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, or HYPP. Other ones that we know are glycogen branching enzyme deficiency, hereditary equine regional dermal anesthesia, or HERDA, severe combined immunodeficiency, um, polysaccharide storage myopathy type 1. Um, there are actually two forms of polysaccharide storage myopathy in horses. Um, malignant hyperthermia and JEB, or junctional epidermolysis bullosa, are the mutations that we know about horses right now that are currently published in the scientific literature. That being said, there's about three or four more mutations that have been identified in the equine research community um, within the last couple of months that will probably be published in the scientific literature within the next year or so. So we really are um, starting to find mutations at a much more rapid rate than we had previously. So between 1992 and um, really 2008, we had identified these seven diseases, and now in 2009, I expect that we'll get three to four more published. So um, just another kind of idea of how much these genetic tools are really helping us to move forward in this area. Just a few of the diseases that are currently under investigation in horses. There's um, congenital stationary night blindness and apoplexies. There's recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis, which is a tying up syndrome um, in thoroughbred horses, which we're working on here at the University of Minnesota, um, as well as a couple of other groups internationally working on that disease. Um, type 2 polysaccharide storage myopathy, um, which is a disease that my research group here at the University of Minnesota is actively working on, and then lavender full syndrome. There are several um, others. I certainly don't have them all listed here. The community is small, probably only about 50 researchers, but really, really actively um, investigating several diseases. So I want to step away from Mendelian diseases just for a minute um, and talk about something that hasn't even been a possibility to research in equine genetics until the last couple of years, and these are what we call complex or poly polygenic genetic diseases. So a polygenic disease would be something, for example, what's been talked a lot about in the popular press with people, um, type 2 diabetes. So we know that these complex um, or polygenic diseases are probably controlled by more than one gene, and they're also likely um, controlled by the environment as well. So in horses, there's several diseases that we recognize have an underlying genetic susceptibility um, and are likely have a polygenic basis. And so some of those ones um, that may be familiar to you are OCD or osteochondritis desiccans, um, which is an abnormality of the joint that usually occurs in young animals. So they tend to get um, cartilage abnormalities in their joints that lead to lameness um, and often loss of use in those animals. 
There's recurrent uveitis in the Appaloosa horse, which is another eye problem in the Appaloosa horse where they basically get recurring eye um, inflammation and eye pain. And the most typical term that's used for this is moon blindness. And so those horses, after several episodes of uveitis, often um, go blind. One area of particular interest to us here at the University of Minnesota and our, and our collaborators at Michigan and also Tennessee is metabolic syndrome or, or the pre and the predisposition to developing pasture laminitis. Um, we believe that there's definitely an underlying genetic uh, defect in this disease and we're working very hard um, to, to basically address that disease and then identifying the underlying genetic defect. Um, another one that researchers at Michigan State University are starting to work on quite um, intensively as well as a group um, in Switzerland is heaves, a recurrent airway obstruction. Again, a disease that we think has some underlying genetic predisposition. Um, the ones that we know, I've kind of uh, talked about this a little bit on the last slide, but OCD um, and the stifle hawk and fetlock, recurrent airway obstruction, um, equine metabolic syndrome. Um, another group of diseases is the uveitis, recurrent uveitis um, or moon blindness, and then also immune mediated, mediated muscle diseases we're working on here. Um, and then one other area that wasn't mentioned on the previous slide is cervical stenotic myelopathy or wobbler syndrome. Horses that have a narrowing of their um, cervical vertebrae, their vertebrae in their neck, um, which then impinges on their spinal cord and causes them to have numbness um, and neurologic deficits in their limbs. And this is actually being worked on by a group at the University of Kentucky. So now I just want to take a minute and run through the diseases that we know about um, and kind of give you a, a brief overview of these diseases, um, how they're inherited, um, and kind of tell you in instances where we know how frequent they are um, in the population. So we'll start with HYPP. It was the first one discovered, um, like I've mentioned, and it's the one that's the most well known. So HYPP is a dominant disease, which again means that one copy of the mutation results in disease. It was introduced by the stallion Impressive, or at least thought to be. We've never actually been able to sequence Impressive's DNA to know for sure if it was him, but it's only been found in his offspring um, in the quarter horse. Um, it's thought that Impressive now has 60 to 100,000 descendants um, from that horse alone. And so, and that was actually an estimate that was made probably five or six years ago now. So that number has only increased since that time. Um, but he has the potential to have passed this mutation on to a huge number of horses. Um, impressive descendants tend to score higher as halter horse, um, halter horses. And it's thought to be when these horses are heterozygous, meaning they have one copy of the mutation, that they actually do better in the show ring um, than when they don't have this mutation. And so inadvertently and sometimes intentionally, this mutation has been selected for um, in halter quarter horses. So I have a quick video here that actually shows you what HYPP looks like um, if you haven't had a chance to see it. So I'm going to start the video and then I'm going to give about uh, 30 seconds for it to upload on everybody's computer and then I'll just chat with you a little bit about um, what you're seeing. to this mare that she has quite a bit of, of sweating. So the signs in this video are relatively mild. Um, horses with HYPP can have um, quite a severe episode that actually um, 
result in them becoming recumbent and having paralysis of important muscles such as the muscles of their diaphragm and these horses can die during this during these episodes so HYPP when it was first um, described and first really talked about uh, for, for several years um, there was some debate as to whether it was a dominant or recessive disease and so if you're familiar with this disease or if you've had experience about it um, that's a question oftentimes um, people ask. So we do think that it's a dominant disease. Horses with one copy of the mutation definitely can show clinical signs and definitely can have fatal episodes of HYPP. But horses with two copies of the mutation um, tend to be more severely affected and are harder to manage and more likely to have fatal disease. So AQHA has actually stepped forward and said that they would like to eliminate this genetic disease from their breeding population. Um, they feel that it's um, important to do, it's important to have rules, and so they have now made um, genetic testing mandatory for all descendants of the stallion impressive. Um, and it's been, that's been in place for about two years now. So the genetic test is mane or tail hair. Um, with hair roots submitted to the genetic testing laboratory at the University of California at Davis. Um, AQHA now actually denies registration of all HH individuals, so those would be individuals with two copies of the mutant gene, and eventually they will deny registration of all individuals with even one copy of um, the mutant gene, and that's projected to be about the year 2020. So the next thing I want to talk about is ovaro lethal white syndrome. So um, if any of you have had experience with paint horses or paint horse breeders, this is going to be familiar to you. Um, but this is a recessive disease in the American paint horse. Um, typically we recognize these foals as that they're white and they have blue eyes. That being said, they don't have to be 100% white. There are reports of lethal white foals with a brown spot. Um, but color is really not the most important part of this disease. What's important to this disease is that these foals are born without a functional gastrointestinal tract. So they're born, they look normal, they typically stand up to nurse, um, can look quite vigorous, but since they have no functional um, intestinal tract, they are unable to pass the first feces or pass the meconium, and eventually they start to colic and deteriorate because they, they, feel, they fill their GI tract. Um, with milk, and that milk is not able to go anywhere, and they and they aren't um, able to pass feces, and so this is a universally fatal disease. There's no effective treatment for this disease. Um, none of the medications that we have to help with the GI tract motility um, work because these foals actually lack um, the nervous control of their GI tract necessary for life. Um, this is another mutation where one copy of the gene um, is thought to be useful and actually results in a desirable phenotype. So one copy of this gene um, results in the ovaro coat color, um, whereas two copies of this mutation result in a lethal white foal. So you'll hear lots of paint breeders say never breed an ovaro to an ovaro because you'll have a lethal white and that's probably a very good piece of advice. So one of the things that people have not recognized um, or the word isn't out about this disease is it's not only ovaro for ovaro. And so when there was a study done actually here at the University of Minnesota where they looked at carriers for this mutation, so over 90% of horses that had the frame ovaro coat color were carriers for this mutation. But also 20% of paint broodstock mares, so those paint horses that were solid color, um, were carriers of the mutation and 10% of Tobianos. So basically, while uh, don't breed an ovaro to an ovaro is probably a good rule of thumb, recognize that lethal white foals can happen um, a bit less frequently of paint horses of different colors. So one of the other genetic mutations that we've known about for quite a while is the severe combined immunodeficiency or SCIDS um, in Arabian horses. Again, this is another recessive mutation. So HYPP dominant ovaro lethal white and skids recessive so far. Um, and this mutation impairs the mechanism necessary to make functional immune cells. So basically when you have a foal that has two copies of this mutation, um, they never develop a functional immune system. 
Typically, um, they're born, they nurse colostrum from their dam, and that colostrum provides them with um, protection, um, provides them with immune system while normal foals, during that period of time in which normal foals would develop an immune response. Um, but for these guys, once the colostrum wears off, they're very, very susceptible to infection, and sometimes colostral antibodies don't even protect them. Um, they typically live for less than um, five months and during that time develop recurrent infection. So about 8% of Arabians in the United States are heterozygous or carriers for this disease, have one copy of the mutation. Um, the genetic testing for this disease is done at VetGen in Michigan. Um, and the Arabian Horse Registry, different from the Quarter Horse Association, highly recommends but does not require testing um, for registration of horses. And the association also has a strong stand that um, breeding of those horses that are heterozygous or those horses that are carriers is discouraged. So junctional epidermolysis bullosa, which is quite a mouthful, so JEB for short, um, is a pair of diseases that we now understand that are, are related but different in um, Belgians and saddlebreds. And so um, Belgian and saddlebred babies that are born with these diseases um, have ulcerated skin at birth, and you can see from these pictures um, where they literally have skin that has big open wounds. They also have similar lesions in their mouths, um, and allowed to live long enough, these foals usually slough their hooves. So um, phenotypically a very, very painful um, and ugly disease. Um, there's two different mutations that cause JEBD or JEB, um, and it's different in the Belgians and the saddlebreds. The first mutation discovered um, by the group at Guelph was in the Belgians, and it's in a gene called LAMC2, um, and it's an autosomal recessive trait. And interestingly, in the Belgian horse, which we're going to see this theme later on, there's a very, very high number of carriers. Almost 36% of Belgians are carriers of this disease. Um, and the genetic test is being offered at the University of California at Davis. Now, saddlebreds also have um, a JEB mutation, and it's been just reported um, at the end of last year in the LAMA3A gene, um, which is related to the LAMC2 gene, but different. It's also recessive, um, and it's also been published that about 2.5% of saddlebreds are carriers of this gene. And to my knowledge, um, there's not commercially available genetic testing for this yet, although I suspect that that will probably be available soon. Um, it's just been recently published, and usually it takes a little bit of lag time after the scientific publication before the genetic test is available to the public. So glycogen branching enzyme deficiency. Um, I have a little video of this, so I'm going to kind of talk about the disease while um, the video is playing. But this is a recessive disease in quarter horses. Um, in which the foals are born weeks of age, um, and the only reason that that particular foal survived as long as he did was intensive management. He was actually hospitalized. All right, so it sounds like um, you guys could not hear what I was saying while um, the video was uh, playing, so I will kind of repeat that. Um, glycogen branching enzyme deficiency is uh, autosomal recessive. Um, these foals are weak at birth, um, have difficulty rising, 
Um, they can have intermittent low blood glucose um, causing seizures. So they are missing the enzyme that's important for creating normal glycogen, which is the storage form of sugar um, in their muscles. And as you saw in the video of the foal, um, they just are incredibly weak. This disease is universally fatal, eventually fatal in um, all foals. The foal that you saw in the video is actually the one that lived the longest. He lived until um, about 18 weeks of age, and the only reason that he um, was able to survive for that period of time was he was actually um, in the hospital his entire life in the referral hospital at Kansas State University where he had 24-hour nursing care, and so basically um, somebody got him up every hour to nurse, assisted him to stand every hour to nurse for the first 18 weeks of life. Um, and when he was discharged from the hospital uh, because his owner wanted to try to take care of him at home, within about four or five days, um, she found the foal um, had died in the pasture. So it um, definitely is, is a fatal disease. We occasionally diagnose this disease also in stillborn foals. Um, but what we have found since that point in time is that we think most foals that are GBED um, actually are aborted much earlier in pregnancy and when we looked at um, undiagnosed abortions in quarter horses um, we found out that five percent of them were due to glycogen branching enzyme deficiency so probably a very very important cause of abortion in quarter horses um, and also a cause of sick foals and about nine percent of quarter horses are carriers of this disease So another disease that we've recently has recently been identified by a group at the University of California at Davis is um, HERDA, Hereditary Equine Regional Dermal Anesthesia. Um, it was also previously known as Hyperelastosis Cutis or Ehler-Danlos Syndrome, um, which were the names that were given this, to this disease based on similar appearing diseases in people and dogs, um, although it turns out that quarter horses have a very different mutation than other species. Um, it's in quarter horses. It's a recessive um, disease, and about 3.5% um, of quarter horses are carriers of this disease. And so what results, as you can see in this picture, is they have very, very stretchy and easily damaged skin. Um, these horses often can be considered normal until someone starts to break them to ride when they're two to three years old and they get um, large wounds and damage to their skin under saddle. Um, so genetic testing for this disease is available at the University of California, Davis. So polysaccharide storage myopathy is the disease close to my heart. Um, it's one that I've done a lot of work on, including identifying um, the mutation. So this is a dominant um, disease. It results in storage of abnormal glycogen, again, that storage form of sugar in the skeletal muscle. And these horses um, tend to get tying up or painful muscle cramping with exercise, muscle wasting um, or atrophy, and sometimes an abnormal gait. We have actually identified um, polysaccharide storage myopathy um, in over 30 different breeds of horses, but this form with the mutation that we know of, um, we've identified in more than 17 breeds now. Um, and we do the genetic testing here at the University of Minnesota. So I've got another video here. I'm going to talk about it really quick before it comes up because um, it sounds like you guys aren't hearing me during the video. Um, this is going to be a video of a horse that um, is tying up, so you're going to see him trotting on the lunge line a little bit, and then the video is going to uh, switch to where we're actually walking him out of the round pen, and you can see that he has a very stiff, stilted gait um, as he's actively tying up. Okay, so as you can see from um, the video of that horse, um, these horses have um, 
quite an, an incredible amount of pain sometimes with exercise and typically these episodes happen again and again and again not not always every time the horse is exercised but um, usually they're recurrent so malignant hyperthermia is a mutation that has was identified originally in 2005 by Monica Alleman's group at the University of California Davis um, it's a, do a dominant mutation which has been identified both in quarter horses and paints and when it was first identified, we only thought it was important if these horses were anesthetized, um, underwent general anesthesia, and more importantly, general anesthesia with certain types of um, anesthetics, um, and, and those are the gas or inhaled anesthetics, so not the kind of injectable anesthetics that are used for routine castrations and those type of things. Um, but when horses were anesthetized um, with inhaled anesthesia, they would have a severe, severe episode similar to the tying up or rhabdomyolysis is the term that we use um, under anesthesia that almost always resulted in death. Well, we recognized here at the University of Minnesota um, just in the last couple of years that while the MH mutation occurs very infrequently in the quarter horse population, about one half of one percent, um, that it tends to occur more frequently in families that also have the PSSM mutation. And when horses have PSSM and also have um, MH, they're much more severely affected. Um, and subsequent to us discovering that, the group at um, California at Davis, who originally published this mutation, has just come out with a paper in the last month or so where they've shown that some horses that tie up that don't have PSSM or RER, some of the other things that we recognize, um, do have the MH mutation and it can cause tying up in some horses even when they're not anesthetized and when they don't have PSSM. So we're learning a lot more about malignant hyperthermia and its importance um, and performance in horses um, as we speak. It's a, it's a pretty active area of research. Um, and genetic testing for this is also available at the University of Minnesota and I believe the University of California at Davis is going to start testing for MH too. So that's kind of a lot of information, but a, an overview of the genetic diseases in horses. There's a lot more that could be said. You could do an hour-long talk about each one of those diseases easily. Um, but I wanted to kind of touch on them all because um, each of you has probably got a little a bit different interest depending on um, the breed you're interested in or, or that type of thing. So when should I test my horse for genetic disease? This is a question that I often hear from people. And so as a, when I have my veterinarian hat on, um, I always say um, when a horse has clinical signs or symptoms that suggest the disease. So if you have a quarter horse that is tying up, um, my recommendation to you would be to test that horse for PSSM and MH, uh, for example. Um, and, and that's kind of an easy thing. If you've got a quarter horse with muscle fasciculations, we would test for HYPP. Um, the other time that I think we aren't very good about doing as a veterinary profession, but I think might be important and we should start doing more, is that pre-purchase exam. So if you have a horse that's going to be a performance horse, even if it's a gelding, um, you probably want to know, um, does this gelding that I'm going to buy have a muscle disease that's going to limit performance? And oftentimes um, we hear a history of someone's bought a young horse at two to three years old, they've never had a problem. The horse gets to be four or five years old and they start exhibiting signs of muscle disease. And it's very typical for a lot of these diseases that um, they don't manifest until the horse is put in a certain environment or a certain type of work. Um, so knowing that can be really helpful in a pre-purchase. And then obviously if you're buying a breeding animal, you want to test for any disease um, that's in the breed. So you know, um, does my animal have this disease in the, in the instance of a dominant disease? or is my animal a carrier and I need to make informed breeding decisions um, with recessive diseases. So the bottom line with this is um, we have identified seven single gene diseases to date and many, many more are going to be identified in the next few years as well as the single gene diseases, I think we're going to start identifying highly heritable polygenic diseases. Um, like I mentioned, we're working quite hard on metabolic syndrome here at the University of Minnesota. Um, there's going to be a lot more genetic testing available, which is going to allow breeders to make informed breeding decisions. Um, it's going to allow horse owners and veterinarians to identify either horses that are showing signs of disease, the cause of their disease, 
but also my hope is that we'll be able to identify horses that are pre predisposed to disease before it happens. Um, for example, if we identify that um, your horse has the genetic mutation for PSSM, before your horse ever is in a situation where it ties up, we can talk about dietary and management recommendations that might allow you to um, not ever have this disease manifest itself in your horse. So with that, I think we've got about 10 minutes of time left, uh, and I know there's quite a few questions that have been kind of coming through as we go. So um, I would like to uh, kind of sort through those questions. So give, give me just a second to read through them. Okay, one of the um, first questions is, which of the listed diseases are dominant mutations? So we've kind of go, gone over that. Um, but just to reiterate, um, malignant hyperthermia, PSSM, and HYPP um, are dominant, GBED, SCIDS, ovaro lethal white, um, and HERDA are all recessive diseases. And typically, um, in most species, recessive diseases are, are more common than um, dominant diseases because people recognize the phenotype of dominant diseases and breed away from it more quickly um, than res recessive diseases. Okay. Um, I have a question about Arabians have um, a, the genetic disease SCID. I'm guessing this question came through before we um, talked about SCID. So I'm just going to click back to the slide about breeding for recessive disease because this is um, talking about that. So the question is, um, with a recessive disease, a carrier bred to a carrier um, actually has about a, has a 25 percent chance of uh, producing an affected lethal foal. Um, because it can be tested for, do you believe it is irresponsible to breed a carrier to um, a non-carrier? Um, and should carriers be eliminated um, from the breeding pool even though we can test for the disease and prevent a lethal foal? Well, I think this, it's a great question um, and it's a great topic of discussion. So, in an ideal world, we would not include any carriers um, in a genetic population. We would just breed away from carriers and then we wouldn't have to worry about the disease at all in that eventually um, we would get rid of the disease and there wouldn't be any individuals carrying it. That being said, the answer to this question depends a little bit on the breed. If you have a breed that's very, very large and has a very genetic pool, very large genetic pool like the quarter horse or the Arabian or the thoroughbred, um, eliminating carriers from the breed over time um, would not have a huge impact on the size of their genetic pool. However, if you have a breed that's much smaller, with a smaller genetic pool, something like the Belgian horse, if you went right away and eliminated all carriers from this breed instead of breeding away from that state over time, you could dramatically decrease the size of their genetic pool. Um, and if you remember me talking at the beginning of a talk, having a very, very small genetic pool um, can result in other uh, mutations becoming very, very high incidence in the breed. So um, I know that's kind of a gray zone answer, but it's kind of a gray zone, um, uh, I guess, question in, in a way because it really depends on the disease, the manifestation of the disease, and the size of the genetic pool of the breed. But a great question and a great discussion point um, that we have all the time. I have a question here about HYPP. The question is, I have had contact with an HH stallion who has never had an episode. So an HH stallion would be one that's homozygous affected, even when under high levels of stress. Does this have any effect on the likelihood of his offspring having episodes? Well, the answer is yes and no. So with any genetic disease, even ones that are controlled by a single gene, um, we recognize that there are other genes within the genome that modify that disease. So this stallion may be HH and never had an episode because he has some other combination of genes or gene, or other gene or combinations of genes in his genome that protect him from really expressing the phenotype of his disease. So if he were to be bred, his offspring, you know, may or may not get those protective genes. So it could be that they have a decreased likelihood of expressing disease, but there certainly wouldn't be a guarantee.
Okay, the next question um, is again about HYPP. Um, and this question is, my friend's mare is positive for HYPP and has episodes of shaking. Um, my horse has never been tested but has never had an episode. Could carrying this gene affect his mortality or future disease process? Um, both horses have impressive as a grandsire. Well, we definitely know that um, with HYPP, I really believe that it's best to be informed and to test your horse. The reason being is that e horses that have one copy of the mutation are, are less likely to show signs um, than horses that have two copies. Um, and But at any point in time, a horse with a copy of this mutation could have an episode, and those episodes can potentially be fatal. So even if just recognizing your horse has a disease doesn't mean that you have to do anything to specific to treat it, um, but it would help you be better and help your veterinarian be better at identifying an episode um, at that point in time. So it's always one of the first questions that I ask if I have a quarter horse that's collapsed for any reason, if I have a quarter horse that um, is down and can't get up, is do they have, um, what's their HYPP status? So as a veterinary clinician, it allows me to make really rapid um, clinical decisions that would be a little bit harder to come to without having that information about the genetic test. Okay, the next question is about HERDA. Um, and this question is, I have heard that the HERDA phenotype has been most often seen in cutting horse bloodlines. Is there any truth to that? Yes, there is truth to that. We know that the HERDA horse mutation is much more common in um, cutting horse bloodlines, and we actually have put out a collaborative paper with the University of California Davis at the beginning of this year that showed um, that was true, um, and there is good research evidence to back that up. That being said, there is um, a lot of um, talk in the lay literature out there about this mutation being traced to um, Poco Bueno, but there is to, to date no scientific evidence to show that the mutation traced to that horse. Um, but yes, it is more common um, in cutting horse bloodlines. Okay, the next question is um, one of my favorite questions, so I'm glad somebody asked this. Um, it seems that in general the quarter horse breed is highly affected um, with or by genetic disorders as opposed to other breeds. Is this a true observation or just that disorders in quarter horses have received more attention and research so far? This is absolutely um, the latter. The quarter horse association has been very, very um, proactive about one, helping to identify genetic diseases in their breed and two, supporting research about those genetic diseases. And so the reason that we know so much about the quarter horse is that um, for the last 10 to 15 years, the Quarter Horse Association has has um, sponsored genetic research, has been supportive of identifying diseases in their breed. So, um, and there are a heck of a lot of quarter horses out there, the largest breed in the world. So this is definitely not that other um, breeds do not have genetic disease. It's that we have had the most opportunity to identify them in the quarter horse. So um, the other question is about DSLD um, ESPA. Um, am I familiar with connective tissue disease? And I might, I'm not sure who sent this question through because I'm looking at cards that Dr. Martinson has kindly made for me. So um, if whoever sent that question through would mind just um, replying what breeds they're interested in. Um, that might help me a little bit on, on uh, answering your question. Okay, there's a question, um, sorry, just moving on to try to get as many of these questions answered as possible. Um, is there any genetic research going on into the phenomenon of how gazelle female offspring that have been identified as XY? Um, not that I'm aware of, but the, probably the place that does most of the research about chromosomal abnormalities in horses is Texas A&M University. So you might be able to do a little bit of searching there and see um, if in their cytogenetics laboratory they've um, done anything with that. That specifically, I do not know. I'm sorry. 
Um, here's a good question. Um, what types of courses in college um, would steer towards this and how would I go about studying this? What types of professions are based on genetics? Um, well, if you're interested specifically in equine genetics, um, there's a couple of different ways to go about it. The equine genetics research community is really small. I would say we're a group of 50 to 60 researchers internationally that really have a strong focus in equine genetics. Um, so most of those people uh, have done one of two things. Some of them are like me in that they're people who have gotten a veterinary medicine degree and then have gone on to got a, and gotten a PhD or have um, done a lot of research post getting a veterinary degree. And then another huge part of the group um, does uh, have don't have veterinary degrees but actually have PhD degrees um, and do just research. Um, unlike myself, who I spend about 25% of my time doing clinical veterinary medicine as well. Um, types of courses in college, um, it depends a little bit on what school you go to and what's available, but certainly um, most either biology or animal science um, programs are going to have an introductory genetics course, which would be the first place to start. Um, if you have an animal science interest, typically there's uh, most animal science programs are going to have some animal breeding classes, some follow-up genetics courses. Depending on the university, they may or may not have a specific equine genetics course. Um, if you really have a long-term interest in doing equine genetics research, um, really having a good solid understanding of math and statistics is quite important. Um, a lot of the things we do in trying to um, isolated gene has to do with statistical analyses and then also an understanding of basic biology and molecular biology all those things are important so um, as far as being kind of a genetics researcher those are those are the things that are important um, Dr. McHugh, this is uh, Gwen, and uh, I know we're getting to the end of our time here, so if maybe we've got uh, maybe one or two more questions um, that Krishana maybe has for you, then, uh, then I'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. Okay. Um, another question that we got, a couple of quick questions that are really good, um, is what are the approximate costs associated with these genetic tests? And so right now, um, for the genetic tests that are available, they're usually between 40 and $65, depending on the test and depending on where it's run. I think as we see more and more genetic diseases being identified, some of the costs for these tests um, will decrease over time. Um, another question that I think is good and applies to everybody, this last quick question is where can one find information regarding what genetic diseases could occur in different breeds? Um, for example, what diseases should Morgans be checked for? It's actually a good question and sometimes that information is a little bit hard to find. Um, we're really trying to work with breed associations to have them um, publicize what we know about in their breed and so the Morgans um, we know have the PSSM mutation occurs in that breed. As far as I know, that's the only mutation that's been identified in the Morgan horse so far. Um, but we have been actually working with the Morgan Breed Association on our metabolic syndrome project um, and a couple of other projects as well. So uh, typically breed associations are the most helpful place to start. Um, otherwise, it's, it's pretty much right now the primary scientific literature. We do have um, an international genome mapping group um, so if you search for Equine Genome Project, if you Google Equine Genome Project, you should come up with um, the Equine Genome website that will talk about, it's actually an introduction to the researchers and where we're from and the diseases that we're working on. So that might be a good resource to start too. And so with that, I know I didn't get to everybody's questions and I apologize for that, but thank you very much. Yes, and uh, we'd like to thank Dr. McHugh for her presentation and also to Dr. Martinson for helping to um, get all of our questions together. I know we had a lot of really good questions today. And of course, we'd like to thank all of you, all the participants uh, here this afternoon. Um, as we mentioned, this webcast is part of a series, and the next webcast in the series will be held sometime this fall. Um, we are still confirming some of the specifics, but once we have all the details worked out, uh, we'll be sending out information via email, through press releases, it'll be on our website, and so forth. Um, so for any additional information on any of our programs, please visit our website at uh, www.myhorseuniversity.com. 
And also, I just want to quickly remind everyone that this webcast was recorded today, and we will be uploading it to our website, um, to the MyForce University website, by the end of the week. Um, so you can come back to it, you can view it again, or share it with um, someone else who may be interested. Once again, if you, uh, please feel free to send us your comments or any suggestions as well uh, to info at myhorseuniversity.com. So in the end, I'd like to just thank you um, for your time, and I hope that everyone has a great afternoon.